Good morning. Good morning, Allison. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. I'm here. It's Friday. Which I'm is loving great. this shirt you're wearing. Are those flowers? Yeah, it's like a floral. It's like, okay, it's reversed. What I'm seeing is reversed to what's happening in real life. So that's why I was, yes, it's like a floral pattern, um, like purples and reds. I really like it too. Thank you. If you match your pumpkin behind you, I like it. I know. Very coordinated. <laughs> and I wore earrings today for the, I mean, I can count on one hand the times I've worn earrings since March. Um, because the mask just bumps up against them, especially if you're wearing something dangly, you know, it just kind of like the mask straps bump. And um, so I feel almost like I just got my ears pierced for the first time. Like I'm <laughs> noticing them, you know, they're like bumping yeah. up against me and I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know. It just feels weird. Hi, Andrea. Good morning. Well, How are you? It's been a I while. Know. You. I miss my earrings. I, I, I love dangly earrings and I've gone to like studs all the time because of the mask. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I should wear studs so that I don't lose my pierced ears. Um, probably because <laughs> when I put these in this morning, I was like, hope they go in. Um, I don't know how long it takes for, I don't even know if they would close up, but, um, I just, it's been so long and I've worn earrings every single day Yeah, before this. Yeah. Yeah. You've got quite the earring collection. Hi, Liz. Good morning, Liz. Oh, it's so nice to be here with friends this morning. Yes. It really is. Um, what should we talk about first? Should I go ahead and get out of the way the thing I've emailed about a gazillion times? And yeah, let's talk about that. Talk about that? Okay. Again. <laughs> um, so this week, and just in like library industry news or whatever, um, this week or the end of last week, they discovered there was a printing error in John Grisham's new book. It's called A Time for Mercy. I can't remember when it came out, but a couple weeks ago, it's relatively recent, but it's been out. And um, it was one of those things where until people started reading it, they didn't know there was an error. And essentially what has happened is they've printed, I think something got messed up with some leaves. And so there's some duplicate pages, but there's also a missing page. You have several page 60s, several page 62s, but no page 58, I think. And so it's confusing to read, but also ultimately you're missing a whole page. Of so it took time for people to notice and contact somebody, you know, whether it's their library or the, you know, if you bought the book or yeah, the bookstore. Um, and so they got, you know, finally worked it up the chain and they started checking inventory and it happened in what sounds like nearly every copy of the book. That was a lot of book. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been, it, it's, it has resulted in, a lot of work for the library because we bought a lot of copies. Um, do you think it's a time for mercy for the person responsible for making sure the book printed correctly? Ooh, yeah. That That's a good one. Sure. That is a good one. That that person, I'm sure, is having a really rough time right now. Yes. Um, but, you know, we That's buy a lot of copies. <laughs> holds on each individual copy and then make sure we get the next not like the next person in line um <clears throat> yeah so that we can check them to make sure that they have all the pages that they need to have and then we've got to and then they um, we have got to take that copy out of circulation and put the person who would be next in line back in line for the book and it's just a lot of work for <laughs> for libraries. Yeah, it's a weird situation, and um, essentially, we're also we anything that has a defect, we have to collect, and then I'm going to have to ship back to our library vendor, and then that vendor, I'm assuming, is going to either destroy them or ship them back to the publisher because it's a quantity so great that the vendor also needs to be reimbursed. Sometimes you get these misprints that are a one-off, especially in certain publications or certain types of books. Large print books tend to sometimes get a weird skipped page thing. Um, and in that case, usually they say, just destroy that. It's not cost effective to send it back. But in this case, when every book was wrong, it is cost effective to send it back. And so we'll have to send all those back and reorder fresh copies. And it was so bad that they did push, even though it's already out, it already had a publication date. They pushed a new publication date to December 13th because they don't think they can get new copies printed in time before then. So... <laughs> So yeah, we're like Leah said, we're calling a bunch of things in, we're checking on things, and we're waiting on people who have it checked out to bring it back in and say, so this book didn't make sense. There's something weird around chapter eight. <laughs> um, 
I totally lost the thread of the plot. Uh, and so then, like she said, we'll either put them back on hold or just we have to wait till we have a good, we know we have a good copy. I don't want to check out a bad copy to them again. So we'll have to wait till we know there's a good one and put them on hold for it. So I felt like a gazillion emails trying to figure out the best way to take care of this situation. <laughs> um, so that was just kind of interesting, something you may not necessarily think about. And also if you had any inclination to purchase that book from the store, I would wait or check page 57-ish through page 62-ish and make sure they're all there. <laughs> and um, if you are on hold for that title, please be patient. The holds list is going to take a little bit longer as we check. And um, we were, we did buy some extra copies that are good. Um, have they, yet, but... Our vendor checked their inventory and they said, these ones are okay. So we did order a couple of those to have on hand if we need to pull any of ours out of circulation. But if we are pulling them out of circulation, it might take a little bit longer for your hold to get filled. Yes, and we do not have those new copies yet, and we already have had to pull ones out. And so we'll, we'll order more to re replace what we've pulled out um, for sure because the vendor will reimburse us. They'll replace for us what we was incorrect. Um, but yeah, so it's a whole. it was a whole ordeal. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, one of those weeks where I've sent a gazillion emails and I'm like, at some point people are going to stop reading these because they're going to be like, this is another email from Allison and I can't do it. <laughs> so. oh, we never get enough of you, Allison. Uh -huh, yeah. Kathy says, sounds like fun for tech services. Kathy knows. Yes, it is. Kathy a lot. Knows. <laughs> yeah, I have. I had to set and we order so many copies of an author like John Grisham. I yeah. do have to like set aside the shelf space to hold these books while they're coming in because it's not a small quantity of books. No, he's pretty popular. It's like if you could have messed up like some obscure author that like no one's ever heard of, that would have been awesome. Right. No. I'm so bad for everyone involved. <laughs> and like Andrea said, a time for mercy for the person who was in charge of quality assurance because oh, that's yeah. that person is going to be in trouble. Not a good day. <laughs> not a good day. What about you this week, Leah? Has anything, any interesting um, library? Library. I don't know, you know. No, no, no. It's, it's been pretty pretty normal at, 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 at Maine. Um, yeah. Just doing the same old, pulling holds, answering reference questions. Right. <laughs> Perp side no, pickup. No behind the scenes drama for you. <laughs> I'm short staffed, but hopefully that, yeah. that will be resolved soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, another thing I did set aside just on a whim, because I know you we've talked about it on here before, like we pull stuff for the show and then we forget about it. Or we talk, we, we talked like the day before we're going to talk about the show and we're like, oh man, I should have thought about this during the week. Well, I did check something out earlier in the week and I was like, I'll talk about this on the show feeling anything else. Um, it's something I don't really know anything about. It's this book called Wheels of Courage by David Davis. And it is, oh, there's a glare. But it is about World War II vets who were paralyzed in World War II um, developing the wheelchair sports leagues, specifically basketball seems like what it's mainly about, um, but how they fought for disability rights and um, for wheelchair sports specifically. And, you know, when they came back from war, they were, you know, if they were paralyzed, they were considered basically done you know yeah. and uh they're like that's not the case at all that's certainly not true we're not over and it was just it seems like a really cool and inspiring story did you know that october is disability awareness month i did not that is incredibly convenient you keep right? talking something is happening with my overhead light and it is strobing and i'm gonna go turn it off because okay <laughs> I'm going yeah, that is that is a very very weird lighting effect you got going on there. Yeah, that was unintentional. Yeah, October is Disability Awareness Month, so hey, and um, this week in particular is Invisible Disabilities Awareness. Oh, okay. Because a lot of people, <clears throat> you know, they look quote unquote normal, which is a horrible term. You should never. But, you know, they, they they have disabilities that you might not realize. And, yeah. you know, those are the people who might get, you know, dirty looks on the bus if they sit in the seat, special seats. Or, you know, people will put nasty notes on their cars when they park in the handicapped parking spot. But, hey, just because, because you can't see the, their disability doesn't mean they aren't disabled. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's really interesting. And I did not know that. And that is 
Very, uh, yeah, called Ghostbusters about that light, Chris says. I probably should. <laughs> in fact, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I hope I don't have an electrical issue. I don't want to <laughs> figure out how to deal with an electrical issue. But that's never happened before. And that wasn't like a bulb going out. It was just like a, maybe it is just a spooky Halloween. Halloween I think so. And Halloween it's like, yeah, built <laughs> in. for you. And it's a, um, oh, what's it called? Like where you can dim it, you know, it's like a dimmer switch. So I wonder if maybe it also could have something to do with that. The fact that it's a, I don't, I don't know. Let's just cross our fingers the next time I use it at work. Sometimes if you go by dimming bulbs on a light with a, with a okay. bulbs, they will all do special stuff. If yeah. you don't buy dimming bulbs, they don't work properly. Well, who knows? Maybe I've actually never replaced the bulbs in this because they're like the <laughs> the kind that last for an eternity. But they could also not be dimming bulbs. The person who put them in before me may not have. I'll look at it. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know what? This makes a perfect segue to our what we planned on talking about today. I am not seeing the segue. So you go for it. Fantasy. Like Just ghosts a- and spooky and supernatural. Supernatural. Fantastical element perhaps my life <laughs> would start flickering and then everything would start shaking and then i would like enter a fantasy world or something right yeah strobe world <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah fantasy and science fiction is what we had kind of yeah. thought oh we'll talk about that this week so i thought i thought it was a good segue <laughs> no that works that works and one reason why we wanted to talk about that is because we both read the same article that we don't remember where we saw it, but we have a memory of reading it, that um, over the past year, 25% of audiobooks sales Purchase. purchases yeah. have been um, sci-fi and fantasy titles. Um, and so we were thinking like, is it because people are looking to escape from the current reality? Is it because, <laughs> you know, what, what, what has drawn people into that? But 25% of audiobook sales have been in those genres, which is pretty impressive. Which makes it the second most popular genre. Does anyone know what the first most popular romance? genre is? Yeah. Romance? Yeah. Because romance is the kind of thing you don't want yeah. someone to see the cover of what romance. you're reading. Yep. So, <laughs> um, yeah, science fiction and um, and part of that, I wonder, like, like a lot of like the 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 sci-fi stuff is sci-fi and fantasy stuff. I think of the like the people who read those is, you know, are like more techie. Like I, I don't know. I guess you you have this picture in your head of the people who read that kind of stuff, and I think well, most audiobooks now are downloadable, so maybe they've got like, you know, the devices and the know how and the. That's I don't true. Know. That's yeah. true. That's a good point. Like I said, for, I assumed for romance, it's because people don't want others to see the cover of the book that they're reading, and it's just better to be discreet in an ebook or audiobook format. <laughs> but I don't think that's the case with sci fi fantasy readers. No. <laughs> but it, it is one of those genres. It's funny because it takes up so much l- less space in our collection than some of the other genres, but it there's so much there. You know, there's. So many new stories all the time. It feels yeah. Like. Yeah. And sci-fi um, definitely, I feel like has, has expanded to include. And, and when we talk about putting things on the li- library shelves in a genre, it's a little bit different than what we'll just do the broader sci-fi genre, but um, you know, it, it has kind of expanded to include, there's a lot of dystopian fiction, a lot of yeah. post-apocalyptic fiction, which can kind of fall under the umbrella of sci-fi, even if it isn't really, science fiction. It's not really science based, you know, it's just more speculative. Speculative speculative fiction is a different thing than science fiction as well. But I think when you're talking about it in the broader publishing landscape, it kind of all falls under that umbrella. Andrea loves the science fiction audiobooks and she especially likes them because she needs to figure out how to pronounce the crazy names, crazy science things. And she doesn't, you know, someone else is reading it to her and she, so she doesn't have to figure it out herself. That is a really good point. And that would also be the case in fantasy. There's usually a lot of crazy names in fantasy as well. Mm-hmm. And with fantasy, we were talking about how it seems like there isn't quite as much fantasy as there is science fiction. And it seems right. like there isn't yeah. well, just volume wise, but we were talking about why that might be. And one reason, the one that I came up with, so it's the one that I'll talk about is because I think that, um, the, um, you know, vast increase in publishing in teen 
books in the past 20 years or so has been able to encompass a lot of that fantasy because there's so many things that you might even call emerging adult. That's a new category Mm -hmm. um, that I think if they were published 30 years ago, they would be in fantasy. That's all they would be is in fantasy. They might be a little bit different, but they'd be intended for adults. But now they're in the YA category and they're these expansive fantasy novels, but just their audience is now young adult in theory, but plenty of adults read them. But I also think that there's a lot of like a certain amount of fantasy that we will accept in a book, book that we would put in the fictions. Like, yes, it's a fantastical element, but it's not so large that I think, oh, this is book is a fantasy book. It's like, oh, right. well, maybe she's got a little bit of clairvoyance or, ooh, you know, yes, maybe the tree throws apples at you, but. It's not enough to make the whole story a fantasy. It's just right. you, you're you willing to, you know, that suspension of disbelief. You're willing to accept a little bit of the fantastical in a fiction story. So Yeah, I think you're right about that. And that is probably a trend in publishing, too, like toward having a fantastical element in your regular or literary fiction um, yeah. and just being willing to accept that along those same lines. I know I mentioned this yesterday, but like, um steampunk it's Mm -hmm. kind of past its moment but it certainly had a massive moment and that that leans toward the fantastical because it's not real but it also isn't really fantasy either but it's that fantasy element in a regular regular story um that allows yeah just that little fantastical outlet but it's not really fantasy also because one of the characteristics as far as i understand it of the genre of fantasy is that expansive world building and if you're writing just a, you know, quote unquote, normal fiction novel with a fantastical element, that doesn't, you're not making that, you're not doing the world building that is characteristic right. of fantasy with right. the right. hierarchies yeah. and that, you know, putting all of that into it, if all it is, is a tree that throws apples, that's just one thing and not the whole thing, which I think would be not what a fantasy, a true genre fantasy reader would be looking for probably. Right. Uh, let's get to some of the comments because yeah. we have a couple pop up. Um, Chris says that he likes um, to read science. She likes having the science, the stars read the science fiction parts they actually perform, like Patrick Stewart reading a book about Picard from Star Trek. Yes. Oh, that's cool. That kind of stuff is great. Yeah. Um, and Andrea recommends the Lightbringer series and audiobooks. They are super good. She says she's not much of a fantasy person, but the magic system is really fun to learn more and more about. So that's really cool. Oh. Like that was one of the things like with um, like one of the things I loved about like the Harry Potter books. And I know mm-hmm. Harry Potter, we all know those. And I've talked about them a thousand times on here. Mm-hmm. It's like Harry wasn't from the wizarding world. So he was, he was like always learning something new. Like mm-hmm. what is this? You know, so he was always learning something new and it was a way for her to keep, keep telling you more about this yeah. magic world that, with, that you live in. So I, yes. I loved learning more and more about the magical world of Harry Potter. Yeah. And learned a little bit more with everything. As he gets older and learns more, you get to learn more along with yeah. him. Yeah. That's a, a great way to do it and to build it in a series. And that, that I realize I do have a fantasy book on my shelf other than Harry Potter because I have The Magician's which we've talked about on here before as well. Yeah. Um, but I do really enjoy that. And it's a similar thing where it's someone who was not part of the world and then learns about it. And so you kind of catch up with them and you see what's possible with them. And that makes it a little easier to learn than when you probably than when you're dropped into like, you know, some type of high fantasy novel and you're just, you're there and you got to learn it all, you know, <laughs> as you go. And uh, I think that's the type of thing that I, I have a very hard time doing i think that's why when i mentioned last week lord of the rings was tough for me because it was a lot of like everything in that world and i had no point of reference for it because it wasn't based in the real world and it was just hard for me to i don't know it's hard for me to learn <laughs> okay um <laughs> chris is like he's a big lovable nerd uh but he loves books based in a world he does tabletop role-playing games oh that's in. cool so, yeah. yeah there are lots of those and they're like they're even like dungeons and dragons mm-hmm. books like i know that's, that's like not the, tabletop, the one you play but what oh is it again yeah, we have those at the library yeah yeah i think um, i uh there's there are just so many good books out there and yeah. 
it's it's really well and they even if we're talking about uh books set in the world of rpgs not the same thing but even for kids we've got the minecraft books we have yeah. we have yeah. these, this endless amount of J fiction minecraft novels because kids they play minecraft on the computer and then they want to kind of they want to keep going with it they want more of it than they can play and then they read a book about it and all of a sudden hey you're you, it's literacy you're learning you know you're increasing your only so much screen time so they have to get their minecraft somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's a good point there's fantasy there's other outlets for fantasy that then can be put into books. We were talking about this too, about Game of Thrones, which of course is a book, you know, first, but um, you know, that's a, a fantasy series on television and people watching that, you know, then may come back to the books and they also may not, I, in my mind, I don't think of Game of Thrones instantly as fantasy, even though it really is. I think of it as you know, just this massive television show. And I think of it as like this medieval setting and stuff, but it's a fantasy and I think it's just become fantasy has become more mainstream. Yeah, yeah, and kind yeah. of developed into things so that those fantasy novels, those fat paperback fantasy novels, aren't. That's not really the way it's delivered anymore. Yeah, but but still, when I think fantasy fantasy novels, I always do think these really thick books because it takes so much. I think because you have to do that world building and explain how everything is different and show, you know all of that like all of the differences and all of the 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 the, the different the you know what's not how we would do something right. it takes a lot more explanation than you know a book that's set in our day and time so yeah and that was one of the things when i was researching this a little bit too that i read that fantasy books often have oh gosh, I can't remember the term they use, but a lot of like, just like political machinations, you know, you got like all these people vying for power yes. in a fantasy book that you also, so there's also a lot of layering of that, of like these power dynamics and political stuff, but set mm -hmm. in, a, in, in a world that isn't ours with characters who may not be human with, you know, all these other things you have to layer in there. And it's, and it's not that sci-fi doesn't do that as well, but these just the, the whole landscape and fantasy, there's a lot of work that goes into making that what it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I kind of feel bad that I kept referring to the book with the tree that threw the apple um, without knowing <laughs> what book I referred to. You didn't make that up. That was a real book. <laughs> it is a real book. Um, Sarah Addison Allen um, has, her books all have like an element of magic in them um, in some way, shape, or form. And um, the one where the tree throws the apple is um, called Garden Spells. Um, I would definitely read it. It's a fabulous book. It's wonderful. Um, but yeah, the yeah. tree throws the water at one point. Yeah. <laughs> well, those lines, another book. And if anyone reads this, let me know. Get back to me. Tell me if I put it in the wrong spot. We put it in fiction <laughs> because it seemed like a fiction story with magical elements rather than a fantasy. But if you read it and you tell me I'm wrong, go for it. I can't read everything that comes in. If only, that'd be a great job. Right. Um, yeah. The book is called The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Can't read the last word. I think it's Harrow. Harrow. My reading is terrible. Um, the Once and Future Witches. And it is set, I believe, in the late 1800s. And it is about women's suffrage, but also there are witches. Like women are trying to uh obtain the vote mm -hmm. but also there's there are witches and there's like magic and witchcraft involved um and so it seemed like it was more historical fiction with an element of magic so that's why it went in fiction but if someone on here reads it and thinks it definitely belongs in fantasy tell me <laughs> i'm out for <laughs> work here <laughs> We'll all pitch in. No. Chris <laughs> says that one of the things that he likes about fantasy books is how the hidden real world issues, um, mm -hmm. they deal with those in a way that is non-threatening, which I think is absolutely true because, um, you know, if, if you start getting into politics or, you know, what's going on with these countries fighting each other, you if you start calling people immediately take sides, you know, yeah. without yeah. looking at like the issues. Whereas yeah. if you're, if they're imaginary people or countries or whatnot, you can look at it from an outsider's perspective yeah. and get to what's underneath in a way where your, your own allegiances don't come into play. So. 
about. Yeah, that's a really good point. And sci-fi certainly does that as well, you know, um, as far as I know, <laughs> um, without <laughs> being someone who reads a lot of it, um, I think also does that kind of thing. I think specifically about when I was in college, I had one of my primary and professors throughout the time I was there was a very, very dedicated Star Trek fan. And he was always pulling it in to our discussions about um, the, the many, many cultural and religious things we were talking about. You know, he was always explaining, you know, or showing clips and stuff like that, which as I don't watch Star Trek, but like I could definitely appreciate where as a, an intellectual person curious and how the world works, how he would get so much out of watching that or something like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I tell you one of the fantasy books that I'm really looking forward to reading? Yes. It's out and I'm on hold for it and I haven't gotten it yet. Um, it's The Incredible Life of Abby LaRue by B.E. Schwab. Um, okay. This woman, she's kind of desperate. She makes a deal with the devil for a more immortality, but no one can remember her. Okay. Like, you know, she's you're immortal, but no one remembers you. So you live this like life of loneliness, but she finds her way to like, um, leave her mark, like in art. And then, you know, she, she finds a way after, after a while of like leaving her mark so that like, she, I, I was here. I, I, I was, you know, yeah. she's that goes on. But then 300 years later, she meets a man in a bookstore and he remembers her name. Yeah. And it's like, why does he remember her? And like, what what is happening? And I'm like really dying to read this story. Oh, that sounds so fun. Very looking forward to it. Oh, Carrie has that on hold too. <laughs> and, yes, Chris, Papa Papa Jean, Jean Roddenberry was ahead of his time, I think. And you know what? I will say Star Trek was very much ahead of its time. And it addressed a lot of issues that like we're still struggling with today. Mm -hmm. It addressed, you know, back in the 60s or whenever. So, yeah. yeah, it was very much ahead of its time. Yeah, that's awesome. And now to segue off of that, um, current, <laughs> I read an article recently that current, especially sci-fi books, are, are in a, a perilous spot with this, but any current book now, everything is behind its time because nothing was accounting for the pandemic. So especially a sci-fi yeah. novel that is, there's different types of sci-fi you know, a million different types, but the type that is supposed to be like cutting edge, um, as one book was described, five minutes into the future, you know, it's just like barely ahead of where we're supposed to be now. All of those books now exist in a totally parallel universe to the one in which the pandemic happened. So sci-fi books that, that are really wanting to be realistic and really wanting to be cutting edge for this gap of a period where people were working on them, they're, they're, just, they're just no longer. And so then, yeah authors have to decide if they want to continue their science fiction venture in the worlds that they've created, or are you going to have to shift and be cutting edge in the world of the pandemic? And um, so, cause that was something, I think that's something they mentioned about this Cory Doctorow book and it is set, it's in a different, it's not in our particular universe. It's a different government. There's a repressive regime and this hacking thing and these terrorist attacks and stuff. As far as I understand, there's a new book called attack surface and it takes place in the same world as a book called Little Brother and a book called Homeland, but those were both about teenagers and Attack Surface is about them as adults. So it's kind of a different audience. Um, but just the, the reviews sequel is what he referred to it as. And, and so, um, but some of the reviews I was reading were like, they like reviewed the book and then kind of gave the context of like, things are different now. <laughs> You know, even though it's not even set in like our particular United States or anything, it's just the brain of the science fiction writer is going to have to wrap around all the current policies, all the current technologies, all the things that have happened, and it's going to have to change their. If you're if you're writing a tech based book, mm -hmm. I will say that I think there have been some like dystopian fiction, science fiction books that have kind of they've anticipated like a pandemic happening. Mm -hmm. there, have, there have been some stories where like, yeah. what brings about the the dystopian future? Sure, that's true. Is, is some kind of pandemic. That's true. Right? And I don't know. Did Becky mention this one? This came out this year. It's a 2020 mm -hmm. publication date. Lauren, 
Lawrence Wright, the end of October, it came out in early 2020, and it is about a pandemic hitting the United States. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so it was very timely. Um, we and asked what was the title? Um, what was the title of the Corey I think of the book, the book you were talking about with the girl being forgotten. Um, the Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V. E. Schwartz. So, and what was the Cory Doctorow title? Attack Surface. Attack Surface. Okay. Just making sure we get those in there for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so we have one final question. Who, in your opinion, is an up and coming fantasy sci-fi author we should read? Ooh. Hmm. Up and coming, huh? <laughs> up and coming. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there are so many, like, good people out there. Um, and I'm, I, I will say, not, neither science fiction nor fantasy is like my go-to um, genre. So and, I don't really know. Don't and know. for up and coming, I honest, I could be wrong about this, but I honestly think the realm for up and coming sci-fi fantasy authors is in the YA realm. I really, really do that think that where you're going to get your first go is either as an ebook or as a young adult with a theoretically with it you don't even have to believe it's a young adult audience I believe it will be marketed an up-and-coming author will probably be marketed toward young adults at, at the very first because I've seen other authors who begin as young adult and then they move into adult books because I think that the young adult market is more accepting yes of those new authors per personally I wish that I I wish that I had a suggestion um this is not not an up and coming author, but up and coming is that Ernest Klein's Ready Player Two is coming out in November. Very excited about that one. I loved uh, Ready Player One, so I'm gonna have to read Ready Player Two. Um, one of the the uh, teen science fiction books that I I don't know how much this guy writes because um, Ben Oliver um, he wrote a book called The Loop. And it, it sounds really, really good. There's this kid, Luca. He's been in prison for like, I don't know, 736 days on the loop. It seems like this like outer space prison um, is what it looks like on the cover of the book. Oh, I've got the cover of the book. The loop. So he's- Ooh, outer space prison. Yeah, so he's being, I could be making up that outer space thing. I think I did just make up that outer space thing. I'm anyway, on board, whatever it is. <laughs> change it, change it now. <laughs> but he's like, he's being held and waiting execution for like a crime he didn't commit. And then like, there are like, something starts happening in the, in, in the prison. Like there are like these weird rumblings, like, you know, something is happening. Mm -hmm. And he gets this message that he needs to escape. And like, Escaping is going to make it look worse, and but is it the only way it's going to save his life? I don't. It sounds really interesting, and yeah. I can't wait to read it and figure out how he escapes because that's yeah. Cool. Well, you'll have to report back to us, and maybe we can do some research on up and coming <laughs> authors between this week and next week. Um, yes, and just see because that was not something I thought to look up. Like we were looking up trends and we were looking up like new releases, but we weren't looking up up and coming authors. So um, that would maybe be something. We'll see if what we can find, if anything. And Andrea is screaming with excitement, I think, over Ready Player Two. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Well, man, we've had our time for today. Fabulous. Um, oh, Peter Kleins is a really wonderful sci-fi author. Not necessarily up and coming, but really great. Well, thank you for that recommendation. Peter Kleins. His other book, um, Armada, is also really good. Yeah. So he's got the Ready Player One and Armada. Yeah. Well, I think we've hit our time. We're beyond our time. Um, so I think it's time to go away. Also, I want to welcome everybody in the comments uh, next week to dress up for Halloween. <laughs> yes. We'll be able to see you back post a picture. Yes. Post a picture of your Halloween costume. Next week will be our, our Halloween special, whatever that ends up meaning. <laughs> More flashing lights from Allison. <laughs> yeah, you know, just you, you can watch as my house becomes haunted right in front of our eyes. <laughs> All right, well, 
I guess we'll see you next week. Please dress up and thank you for joining us. We love doing these videos. So we really do. So thanks for, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for hanging out with us. Bye guys. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.